first I want to thank the organizers for organizing this meeting and in fact running it for a number of years <coughs> as well as for inviting me here. I have to say that uh, I'm myself really new to resurgence, um, at least compared to all the other speakers. Uh, in fact, 95% <coughs> of what I'm going to tell you I learned from either Marcos or Maxime and I want to thank them for sharing their wisdom, so that was very helpful. Uh, the only little piece which is new will consist of two concrete theorems that I mentioned toward the end of the talk, and uh, these two theorems come from uh, two papers, one of which is <coughs> with Marcus and his very bright student, Pavel Putrov, and the other is from paper of um, Pavel and Kumran Buffa. So in this talk, I'll try to uh, make connections between two completely different subjects, <coughs> one which already appeared earlier this morning and the other one which has to do with modular forms. So I'll try to show and illustrate how we can go back and forth between different subjects. First of all, by asking questions of one subject in the context of another, how the links sometimes can provide the answers to questions, sometimes quite surprising answers which are not expected if you're narrowly focused just on one particular topic. It's a good illustration that bridging two fields uh, may actually help to understand structure of, of things that we're trying to study. Um, and uh, I'll also raise a lot of new questions by going back and forth and by thinking about this in a broader context. Uh, will lead me to lots of questions uh, that I'll, I'll now use as opportunity to ask during this meeting. In fact, if any of you happen to know the answers, uh, please get back to me and I'll be happy to um, learn more. So, like I say, I'm new to this and uh, I'll enjoy learning this even further. So I'll start with uh, theory of modular forms and uh, this will be somewhat pedagogical. I'll soon get to the place where I want to be, but I'll try to frame it in a more uh, canonical context so that if you're interested just in resurgence and have less familiarity with modular forms, this won't be uh, <coughs> too harsh on you. So mo modular objects or modular forms specifically are defined as uh, objects that transform nicely, in this case uh, under SL2Z uh, modular group. So f is our function of variable tau, and we require that as if we perform fractional linear transformation on tau, f transforms in a nice way. Here a nice way means that it gets multiplied by c tau plus d to the power k. k is usually called the weight of the modular form, and uh, this factor is an uh, automorphic factor that again appears in theory of classical modular forms. Later in the talk I'll show you somewhat more uh, abstract or different versions of modular transformations where you can modify this rule in various ways. For example, you can add additional terms and so on. So depending on uh, how you set up your story, you'll get slightly different variants of modular objects called forms and um, used with other adjectives. But uh, this, is, this is the standard one. So let's, let's continue from here. So our starting point is a function of variable tau and um, we want to characterize it. I also should say that here I'm focusing on standard Möbius group, which is SL2Z. You can also look at various finite index subgroups or, uh, or other modular groups. So at least for SL2Z, the story is generated by uh, two generators conventionally called S and T, represented in matrix form as, as shown on the slide. And one of them basically inverts tau, is asking how function of tau is related to function of minus one over tau. That's interesting, that's in physics would be called strong weak coupling duality. But uh, T does something a little simpler, it basically says that function of tau plus one is the same as function of tau and there is no uh, contribution from this automorphy factor in front. So this um, second uh, fact that f of tau plus one is f of tau immediately tells us that it's a good idea to first of all exponentiate tau 
introduce q, which is exponential of 2 pi i times tau, and then uh, this second rule will be implemented automatically. Uh, also shown here is uh, the fundamental domain and various translates of fundamental domain with respect to SL to Z uh, elements. So for example, shift by plus one takes fundamental domain here by minus one here <coughs> and S does the inversion. So we have uh, this form of the cusp instead of going to infinity and so on. So this is uh, how standard theory of modular forms usually begins. And just like I mentioned a moment ago, uh, the T generator that tau is supposed to be same as tau plus one tells us that we should we better work with variable Q, which is e to the pi i tau. And uh, in the rest of this talk, it is this variable Q which will be playing the central role. Or in other words, I'll be asking all kinds of questions, how Q is related to various other types of variables that, that will appear. And we'll be thinking about function of tau actually as a Q series, as a power series expansion in Q with some coefficients a n, which a priori are completely unconstrained. They can be anything as long as this object satisfies this modularity requirement that under uh, S transform or more general SL to Z transforms, it behaves in a way we want it to, to behave. So that's where it starts. So again, if you open a textbook and start learning the subject from scratch, you may ask what are the simple examples of modular forms? Let's try to construct them. And standard way to construct something which behaves nicely under the group is roughly speaking to sum over images with respect to that group or perhaps sum over lattice points. So <coughs> um, then you can pick different entity which you're trying to sum over lattice points. In this case, say lattice is of the form uh, of complex numbers which are of the form m plus n tau, where tau is complex variable, m and n are integers, and you can try to uh, some image of the rational function, or it it's, uh, translates at, at these different points, um, which basically gives you uh, this uh, Eisenstein series. So for each given k, again, remember k is the weight, uh, this defines Eisenstein series. And you can nicely run, uh, write it in terms of q, uh, q expansion, where uh, sigmas are divisor functions. These are uh, sums of divisors to suitable powers. For example, sigma 2k minus 1 of n takes divisors uh, of n, positive divisors of n, raises them to the power 2k minus 1, and um, adds them together. So this is. Uh, our first modular form, or rather uh, simple class of modular forms, uh, which you can massage a little bit further. You can do Lambert series resummation. So on the right hand side, we saw that in the Q expansion, coefficients are given by divisor uh, function, this sigma of n. Uh, coefficient of Q of n is sigma of n. So <coughs> standard Lambert series resummation says that that also can be written uh, in a much nicer form by introducing denominators, which are also uh, functions of Q. In fact, in this, uh, you, you kind of get geometric series progressions, which in the end resummon to these uh, divisor functions. So <coughs> the first non-trivial example is Eisenstein series uh, E4. Um, first of all, you can quickly show that for um, odd values of uh, uh, the subscript, you get zero because you're summing something and there are contributions with pluses and minuses, so they cancel. So first of all, the subscript has to be even. And then E2 is a very weird guy. Uh, you may want from the start, even before you start any analysis, look at values of the subscript of this index uh, greater than two, simply for convergence reasons, because you're summing over two-dimensional lattice and um, of some of, of a rational function whose denominator is controlled by this index k. So from the very beginning, you may want to look at E4 as your first starting 
point. And again, just uh, as we discussed on the previous slide, this is how it looks like. You can use this Lambert series resummation to write it in very nice form where in the numerator you have n cubed, uh, q to the n, and then you divide by this one minus qn uh, factors. So after spending uh, some time working with Don Zagier, I learned my lesson that if you ever have to write a Q-series or any uh, function, it's always a good idea to write first few terms. So from now on in my life, every time I write any function or any series, I always present uh, first couple of terms. So then you can't have negative powers of, N of Q? Uh, no, 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 uh, never, at least uh, in, in this subject. So sometimes you may want to require the leading term, the constant term, to be zero. In that case, you get cusp modular forms. And again, you may impose further additional conditions which basically tell you how it behaves at the cusp. That's very interesting. That constrains the structure or modifies the structure a little bit. But you definitely prefer not to go too far in the negative region, at least in the traditional theory of modular forms. So this first uh, non-trivial example of Eisenstein series E4 uh, is uh, quite, quite nice and interesting. Again, here is uh, the first few terms of its Q-series expansion. And um, like I mentioned earlier, you can obtain modular objects by summing over uh, lattice. And, and this Eisenstein series you can obtain by summing over lattice in several different ways. One is by summing rational function uh, with power 2k in the denominator, that's how we introduced it. Another one is actually as a theta function, where you sum exponential terms over lattice points. And uh, here in this case, if you sum over root lattice of E8, you get a theta function, which is in fact the same Eisenstein series. So this can be obtained in a number of different ways and has many interesting properties. So this is very concretely, if you haven't seen modular forms in action before, that's, that's how it looks like. Here is the next one, E6. Um, as I say, only even uh, values of the index or argument uh, give you something non-trivial. So Lambert summation gave us that formula. Again, following Don's advice, I write for you first few coefficients explicitly. And here below in the plot, uh, I show how the real part of this function behaves. It's very nice inside the unit disk. And uh, it has interesting behavior as we approach the boundary of the unit disk. And later in the talk, this um, a phenomenon of approaching the boundary of the unit disk will play an important role. So not exactly the way uh, it's shown in the picture, but in a closely, in a closely related way. So that's um, our, first, uh, our first two examples. Uh, we could try to go further and look at E8 and so on. But one interesting fact about uh, modular forms, at least traditional modular forms I'm presenting for you, is that the condition that we imposed from the beginning that object f under modular transformation is some factor times f of tau is multiplicative. And as a result, if you'd have two objects which transform very nicely with respect to modular group, you can multiply them. So they form a ring. And in this case, it turns out that the two guys that I already showed for you, E4 and E6, uh, in fact generate the ring. So uh, the ring of modular forms is freely generated by these two fellows, which means if I now uh, start uh, computing E8, it will be expressed as E4 squared. E10 will be basically E4 times E6 and so on. I have to get to weight 12 until I start seeing something more than one dimensional um, space of, of such objects. By the way, did you notice something else about examples I just showed you? Integers? Exactly. So their coefficients are integer. And this is kind of interesting because the original way we define modular form did not require this integrality. All we had is requirement that it was a power series in Q that already used the T generator. 
And then this power series in Q should have had nice property with respect to S generator, which inverts tau, but that did not a priori had to give anything with integer coefficients. So it's rather peculiar that the answer turns out, and in fact in many cases in the theory of all kinds of modular forms, uh, the coefficients come out to be integers. So natural question to ask is, what is uh, the nature of these integer coefficients? Uh, are they counting something? Usually in mathematics, every time you see an integer number, it's counting something. So the natural question is, what is it counting in, in our case? A more modern version of the question is, <coughs> if you see a number, integer number, you can ask, um, does it represent dimension of some vector space or maybe some cohomology theory? And in fact, already from our discussion, we see some hints for it that um, our integers are not necessarily positive or negative. Even the two examples I showed you indicate that there is no positivity condition. So they can be just dimensions of something or counting something. Our numbers, even if they have such interpretation, are likely to be of the form uh, of an index where we sum various dimensions with plus minus coefficients. So therefore, what could possibly be is, and that's a big question mark, whether our Q-series expansion can be written as a graded early characteristic of uh, some vector spaces which are doubly graded. Uh, M determines the sign and N determines the power of Q. So as I mentioned <coughs> earlier in this talk, I'll try to ask lots of questions to which uh, I would love to know answers. And maybe on this board, I'll summarize my questions. These are real questions for you, and uh, I don't want to go astray and, and uh, use much time of the talk for this, but especially after, please tell me if you have really good answers or good ideas. And my first question is, even in the context of modular form, is there cohomology theory which is doubly graded, which provides, uh, which makes this equality true. So the fancy name for this finding such spaces is called categorification. So Anywhere in life where you see a Q series and if it has integer coefficients, it's a good habit to ask this kind of question. And um, again, modular forms provide lots of examples of Q expansion with integer coefficients. So therefore, I want to ask, is there a homology theory which really makes it true? So does the Wheaton index <coughs> in supersymmetry context? Things like that. Uh, in some cases, it could be realized as uh, not quite with an index, but elliptic genus. Uh, so it is an index, but again, I don't really know. Uh, so, so, so. Again, if you happen to know the answer, please tell me. I would love to hear. I, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. In mathematics, the closest I could find is a talco homology, but that's not exactly answering this question. For example, I cannot just say that H is there are etalka homology groups. Unfortunately not. So if, again, you know the real uh, version of, of this answer, please, please let me know. I'd be very curious. And um, again, I'll try to ask analogous questions as we go along. So with this frame of mind, what are these integer coefficients counting? Can we realize them as graded dimensions of, of uh, cohomology groups of vector spaces, let's continue. And in one class of examples of modular forms, I will give you affirmative answer where the answer will be crystal clear. And in fact, not just it, it's not just exists, it's actually useful for people in completely different area. So in that case, uh, there will be answer and uh, that makes me hopeful that more generally uh, that can be true. So continuing with a crash course on modular forms, <coughs> we should go a little bit further, and um, like I mentioned to you earlier, uh, the next interesting thing appears if we start going increasing weight of modular form in weight 12. So first we introduce Dedekind eta function, which is given by that early type product of 1 minus q to the n, 
And this function by itself is already a pretty cool function. First of all, it has a Q series expansion as a sum, and, and it has this uh, theta like expansion with coefficients which I denote chi n. These are characters uh, of something of conductor 12 that is not terribly important, but the same coefficients will appear later in one of the following slides. But already this function itself is counting something cool. If you take that infinite product, forget about the prefactor q to the 1 over 24, and just invert it, then you see that you have 1 divided by a bunch of geometric series progressions or, or factors which can be expanded in geometric series, and that expansion will have positive coefficients. And those positive coefficients in Q expansion, if you invert this infinite product, is actually counting two-dimensional Young tableaus or 2D partitions, which plays a very important role in many subjects from random matrix theory to uh, modern gauge theory. Now, in the course of modular forms, Dedekind eta function is interesting, but what's even more interesting is its power 24, which gives you function delta called the modular discriminant. And this is modular form of weight 12. This is not so hard to show by taking logarithmic derivative of delta of tau. And like I told you before, um, everything should be uh, generated by, uh, our ring of modular forms is generated by E4 and E6, so delta should be expressible in terms of E4 and E6. In fact, there are exactly uh, two non-trivial, well, the space of weight 12 modular forms is two-dimensional, so uh, therefore everything should be combination of E4 cubed and E6 squared, and delta is such a combination given by this expression here. So <coughs> you can... Um, multiply it out uh, to get the first few terms uh, as Don Zagir taught me to, to do for every function. So <coughs> to understand the meaning of this integer coefficients, there is actually an answer in, in theory of classical form, modular forms, of course, but it's not in the form I wanted. It's not in the form of this categorification where you take coefficient and write it as graded Toller characteristic. It's much more contrived and not satisfying for, for our purposes. But there is an answer, and uh, as an honest guy, I'll, I'll tell you what the answer is. So the answer goes via Borel transform. And if I were Emil Borel, I would definitely write reference complaint. It could go something like this. Uh, hey, uh, there is, uh, in a closely related context, a very similar transform called Borel's transform that you saw earlier this morning, which basically does this. So given a function f of x, you can produce its, uh, in this case, in number theory, usually called Mellin transform for whatever reason, um, uh, transform which is ver a function of variable s. And I want to point out that it is indeed closely related to Borel transform of uh, earlier this talk and uh, much of what's, what you're going to see during this day, if you write uh, x in uh, exponentiated form, if x is exponential of some other variable, then basically what this does is uh, precisely the Borel transform, which you see in resurgence a lot of times. So that's already a very interesting, nice connection to the uh, Borel transform, and integral also goes over ray, in this case goes from zero to infinity, and so on. So we apply this version of the transform, uh, Mellin transform, to uh, our modular form to obtain uh, a function, which again in the context of resurgence would be some version of Borel transform, that uh, encodes some information about integrality uh, or gives partial answer to this integrality that, that I wanted. And uh, what we get is a function. And a number theory, just like in resurgence, it's a good habit to ask about analytic properties of this function. It's, it's an natural to ask where does it extend in a complex plane, where the singularities are, what are the poles, what are the zeros, residues, and so on. So this transform in this case specifically gives L function, and there are several versions of L function, uh, one I denote by lambda and the other by L, uh, related by this gamma factor. 
Lambda is more natural if you want to ask analytic questions about extending this to complex plane. And then, in fact, if you apply this Mellian transform to our class of modular forms or closely related objects that we introduced before, you're going to find that it's an entire function and has two poles, uh, one at s equals zero, the other is at s equals k, where k is the weight. It usually has some symmetry where you exchange the two, and the coefficient of this, uh, the residue of this poles, the coefficient, vanishes if the leading term in the Q-series expansion vanishes. For example, for cusp forms, uh, this would really be entire function. So for analytic number theory, this lambda is more uh, natural. For uh, algebraic number theory, where we ask about integrality, this L uh, object uh, defined by a prefactor gamma is, is more natural. L is the Dirichlet L function of a modular form a modular object F, and you can define it um, um, more directly simply by taking coefficients of the Q expansion of our original modular form, which was sum over n a n Q to the power n, and dividing them by n to the s. So formally, this def defines some function of s. And then again, you ask the uh, same, same type of question. What kind of function is it? What is it analytic structure? that I briefly mentioned on the previous slide, and so on. So <coughs> in number theory, there is an answer uh, to, to, inte to integrality of these coefficients a n, namely um, they're counting something. They're counting points on varieties over finite fields. So uh, first of all, you take the L function, you write it as product over all primes up to some finite set which uh, may be related to a discriminant of your variety or um, uh, maybe empty set in fact. Uh, and you get something like this. You have universal factor for, for each prime. And uh, again, weight k appears over there. And when k is equal to 2, in the special case of weight 2, what happens is that the number of points um, so, sorry, these coefficients uh, that appear there, these APs, um, these are basically the same coefficients of our original series, except that we're taking them at prime value of the index n. They're counting number of points on elliptic curves over fields, uh, finite fields Fp with p elements. So AP is often called uh, P defect because nor naturally you would expect that roughly speaking number of points would be the same as number of points in this field plus one which is P plus one and A describes how much your answer is really different. So the integrality of coefficients A at least uh, for prime values of P and then multiplicatively for others are related to numbers of integer points over elliptic curves. So this is a classical result, which originally was uh, shimura tiniyama conjecture, and uh, then rediscovered by Andre Bay, and uh, finally made into mathematical theorem by Andrew Wiles and many of his collaborators and followers. So this is pretty beautiful subject, and it's interesting that uh, the people involved had very interesting character or life. Uh, so each of these guys is a quite interesting character. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Taniyama died very young, so he committed suicide. Uh, I didn't know this, but uh, preparing for the talk, I checked uh, the history of this on Wikipedia and discovered that actually his fiance also committed suicide shortly after. And that's actually a very touching story of true love. So that's, that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, Gora Shimura is also an interesting character and um, at Caltech we had visiting committee earlier this week before I came here. And um, Dick Gross told me about interesting discovery that Gora Shimura made in Princeton. So he spent much of his life and a big part of his life in Princeton. And uh, Princeton math building is very boring. It's like a tower with many floors, about 10 or 15 of them. And um, 
it's it's uncharacteristic building. Uh, all floors are identical. It's 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 a very uh, boring looking structure. So Princeton students made a very nice prank one day. So they basically switched buttons one, two, three, four, and so on in the elevator. So if you press button seven, you would go to fifth floor, for example. So what else they did? They also switched the office labels accordingly. So you come out of the elevator and you go to, all halls are exactly identical, so you go to your office and um, uh, the office is in the same place, it has your label, but then your key doesn't work. So that morning, uh, security on campus got lots of calls from people that, that their keys do not work. And Goro Shimura was the one to make a discovery that actually the levels were different simply because he decided to leave his office and take the stairs down. And then he suddenly realizes that he has to go many flights, many more than he would normally do. So he made many interesting discoveries. <laughs> if you, so he, here are uh, the, uh, Wiles theorem, formerly known as Shimura-Tinyama conjecture, is about way two modular forms, which makes a correspondence uh, to elliptic curves over uh, finite fields. <coughs> but uh, in, in higher weight and in other variants of modular forms, this is part of modularity program uh, where you're not necessarily counting integer points of uh, the full variety itself, but of a certain piece called motif, and uh, that's ongoing interesting research program. So continuing with our crash course on modular forms, uh, in weight 12, as I told you before, there are only two non-trivial generators. So if you already have our modular discriminant delta and say e4 to the cube, you can take the ratio and this object should have no automorphy factor at all. So in fact, it should be modular function, not modular form. It should transform without any automorphy factor. And that's how it looks like. And curious thing, since I emphasize counting a lot, this object also counts something. Its coefficients are also integers and it counts dimensions of representations of the monster group. The uh, maximal uh, sporadic, uh, the, the largest sporadic group. So there are lots of connections between these coefficients and counting of things, but again they appear as random isolated uh, facts and what I would love to see if there is an answer to this question, can we reconstruct them as index of something? So finally, for purposes of my talk, I want to introduce one last ingredient, which also has very nice story or character attached to it, namely character of Ramanujan. Last year there was a very nice movie. I encourage those of you who haven't seen it to, to go and see it. It's also a very touching story. Unfortunately, just like Taniyama, Ramanujan died very young. Uh, in his early 30s, and it's, it's a very sad story, but it's also a very touching story. And uh, another touching fact about it is that he introduced yet another class of modular objects, which at that time he didn't even think about modularity. He was thinking of Q-series expansion and Q-series properties. So, for example, a power series like that, uh, summing over M with Q to various powers determined by M, is, is a, uh, one of the expressions that, that he wrote for from his point of view. And now this class of objects goes by the name of mock modular forms. And again, there are various interesting subcategories. And uh, these are modular objects of 21st century, I probably should say, even though they're quite old, uh, their properties and structure we're still uh, about to discover. So that's, that's the last class I want to mention, and then I want to mention uh, an interesting intriguing property of this class, which actually has very old history. Uh, Don Zagir calls it strange identity, and it involves uh, an object which is also a close cousin of uh, this mock modular forms, in fact, a special case of it that I showed in the previous slide. And what's strange about this identity is that the two sides of this identity are never well defined at the same time. The left hand side, written as a sum of 1 minus q times y minus q to square and so on, is only defined if q is a root of unity, and in fact uh, was 
uh, Don was inspired by talk that Maxim gave exactly 20 years ago. It was 1997, so now we should celebrate 20th birthday of, of this expression. And in fact, Maxim actually was looking for analytic continuation of Witten Rishitikin Turaev invariants. So I'm sure that somewhere in the back of his mind, uh, it was closely related to theme of this entire discussion we have today that uh, in particular the rest of my talk. So this side of the equation is only defined at roots of unity. So if you picture the unit disk, so this the left hand side only makes sense where the sum terminates and these are precisely uh, roots of unity points on the unit disk. The right hand side on the other hand is nice Q-series expansion. In fact, it's roughly speaking half derivative of the dedekind eta function. So coefficients chi are exactly the same as on the previous slide. And if you roughly differentiate uh, the dedekind eta function, which was also theta function like this, it didn't have n in front and the sum. So if you differentiate the dedekind eta function with respect to tau, you'll pull down n squared, and that's what half derivative refers to. If you pull down just n and not n squared by, by differentiating with respect to tau, you get this sort of expression. So it's very much like the dedekind eta sum where I stick n times the rest of the Q series. And this is perfectly defined inside the unit disk. So right hand side is defined inside the unit disk when absolute value of Q is strictly less than one. And uh, left hand side is defined on the unit disk. But of course what relates this guy is, is the property that if you take Q uh, to be, so this is Q plane. If you take Q from inside the unit disk and ask about the limit as you go to root of unity, you recover the left hand side. So that's what this identity means. And uh, that's... It also works for formal expressions with any root of one equals and make a symmetric extent. Yeah, so well, it can make kind of, I think, also formal expansion near any root of one for the left hand side and the right hand side as well. Um, pro yes, I, exactly. It's yes, yeah. Exactly, yes, yes, yes. But that's right. Yeah. Th so the, the limits and their expansions coincide in, uh, in the vicinity of a root of unity. So that's what the strange identity means. And uh, my goal in the second half of the talk is present you a context where, first of all, this strange identity is not strange at all, where it's natural and it happens a lot. And uh, also answer the other question <coughs> about uh, Role of integer coefficients. Yeah. The function when it's, it's very discontinuous on the on the disk or on the on the surface because it's, it's only for a fraction that, that you can make some sense of it. So the left hand side is only for fraction, meaning on. Uh, in, um, it's, yeah, it's very discontinuous. It's uh, only defined at, at roots of unity, and uh, yeah, but this 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 is defined inside the unit. So what happens if you reach any other point on the unit circle, not the root of unity? Um, well, again, it's it's pretty badly divergent. I would say I, I don't know what happens. Uh, uh, because if, like if, if it's not a root of unity... It it's like choose out a summable, I don't know. Maybe. I, I, I don't know. That's a good question. At least I don't know the answer. Okay. So the second half of the talk is going to be a completely different subject. So, and that's where, like I say, making connections and bridges is natural. In fact, the question about modular forms that I ask about interpreting the coefficients as index of something actually comes from this other field of mathematics that has to do with uh, three manifolds and uh, low dimensional topology. So there, my question, and I'll also pose this as a question, is how to associate a Q series to a three manifold. So that's, that's my second question. And I don't really know the answer. So if you know any way how you associate Q series to a three manifold, of course for this you probably would be low dimensional topologist, please tell me. Because the answer is either going to be related to what I'm going to tell you next, or it's going to be something new and something cool. Okay? 
And I, I'll be really interested. I'm, I'm not joking. I'm, I'm really interested. Then in this field, we can also ask analogous question. If you have a Q series, just like we had in the previous uh, first half of the talk, it will be expansion uh, with respect to Q. If it happens to have integer coefficients, it's also natural to ask, and people in this field ask a lot, this kind of question, what are the vector spaces, perhaps graded vector spaces, whose graded dimension of these integer coefficients are encoding? So for, from the viewpoint of low dimensional topology, this is a starting point for asking more interesting questions about vector spaces homology, but first you have to have a Q series with integer coefficients. And again, I actually don't know how to associate Q series to <coughs> a three manifold or, or other uh, objects in low dimensional topology, so I'd be extremely interested to hear. So one standard invariant of three manifolds, which is very powerful, is witten rishitikin turayev invariant. It's computed by chern simons path integral, exactly as Marcus uh, explained in his <coughs> morning talk. And uh, it's a path integral over gauge connection A, whose exponent is uh, k times chern simons action, as is the chern simons functional that Marcus wrote on the blackboard. And uh, k is the level integer uh, that has to be integer because uh, the integral needs to be well defined. So <coughs> in this uh, story, as well as in many other quantum field theories, you can start Feynman diagram expansion, which is basically saddle point expansion of the integral. This is something that physicists do and love. And it's precisely a good starting point for resurgence because you obtain perturbative expansion or settle point approximation to the integral. Uh, you have vastly growing number of diagrams. In fact, this is stolen from paper of Marcus where uh, this table and examples of diagrams show you the number, the different number of loops. R is the number of loops, um, maybe minus one, and D is, is the space of such diagrams. So, like I told you in the beginning, both Marcus and uh, Maxime influenced a lot of uh, what's going on here. So, again, I want to uh, thank them for sharing that wisdom and hopefully not blaming me for stealing the pictures from the papers. Um, so, like Marcus said, we can start doing perturbative expansion uh, to the, of this path integral and try to approach it with resurgence theory. So, in this context, we'll use two versions of resurgence theory. One is roughly 200 years old, goes to Picard, Lefschetz, talks, and so on. And unfortunately, it will not be enough to treat some of the questions that arise in Chern simons theory and its analytic continuation. So we'll have, uh, we'll have to resort to resurgence of Picard, Lefschetz theory, which uh, no pun intended is called resurgence. So that's only 20 plus something years old. And again, there are many key players here in France. So uh, this will be version 2.0 of picard lefschetz theory that will be able to tackle certain technical difficulties that, that we're going to see um, in, uh, in this analysis. If you are naively applying picard lefschetz theory to schern simons path integral, you expect roughly the following. You expect that if you complexify your variables or fields in this case, you naturally will get expansion where you have saddle points that are various flat connections. And again, if you complexify, this will be complex flat connections on a three manifold M3. And for each one of them, you have this kind of trans-series expansion where you have exponential factor that I made very explicit. It's basically trans-Simons functional of a given flat connection times perturbative series expansion in one over k. So for purposes of this talk, um, I use several variables. So q is exponential of h bar, and this is same as two pi i divided by level k. So the small parameter is roughly one over k, okay? So, what is the notation? So, so that, that perturbative... Yeah. Over M3 is real dimension. Yes, yeah, so this is three-dimensional manifold. 
uh, critical points or subtle points of this action functional are precisely flat connections and M is the set of flat connections. But, but do you say complex? Uh, how do you complexify? Oh, because uh, in resurgent analysis as well as in Prokhorolevsky's theory, a uh, natural thing is to complexify the regional variables. So over the three manifold you have some so, bundle, but right. you have connections, but connections are real? Uh, well, originally we had G bundle over three manifold M3, and uh, then naturally we pass to uh, GC bundle, basically meaning that if you had connection A, you now, which had some reality condition, for example, it was Hermitian, anti-Hermitian, now you make it uh, complex valued and declare that all complex values of its components are allowed. So just formally complexify. Because doing this may help you find subtle points which are not necessarily on the real axis uh, or, or um, and, and they still may have important contributions. So you formally complexify everything you had before and then uh, <coughs> it, it, yeah, decompose, right, so yeah, I, I should probably not say that. Okay, so there are two versions uh, or two, two ways to look at such uh, integrals using saddle point approximations. Uh, one is where given each critical point, which I denote by alpha here, you associate to it uh, all trajectories of steepest descent that Marcus mentioned earlier, and they usually sweep out some surface called Lefschetz symbol. So that's a picture of a Lefschetz symbol. And then you can project this Lefschetz symbol onto uh, what will be called Borel plane. This is basically projection by your action functional. So S of A projects you to complex plane. So values of S is precisely the, the what I'm going to call Borel plane later. So the thing is, so th then what you get, at least for naively, you would expect that your witner richetichin drive invariant in this case has expansion of this form where this is perturbative series around each saddle point, some over saddle points with some coefficients and alpha, which are related to what Marcus called C and determine the choice of the contour. The problem is, and this is one interesting thing where picard lefschetz is not gonna be enough, is that uh, in turn simons theory, each flat connection has infinitely many lifts. And that's a delicate thing. So the space of all gauge connections, modular gauge transformations is not simply connected. You may go on a closed <coughs> loop, kind of like this, and each alpha has infinitely many copies. That's related to the fact that in four dimensions we have instanton number, and that's also related to the fact that <coughs> turn simons of alpha is the same as turn simons of alpha plus any integer, namely that turn simons functional itself is only defined mod integers. So what happens then is that instead of one saddle point, you have infinitely many towers, uh, in infinite towers of saddle points. So <coughs> that's already kind of tricky, and that's why I introduced here this notation bold alpha, which denotes the lift of your saddle point into, uh, into this tower. This is interesting thing, and I, should, I think I should have interesting applications to other problems of trigonometric or hyperbolic nature. So if you have Q difference equations, if you have trigonometric or hyperbolic integrable system, you'll have similar phenomenon. You'll have uh, sometimes this infinitely many lifts of a single uh, saddle point if your equations are written in trigonometric form. So that's... that's so Cross Z means that now we are working on a universal cover. So instead of space of all gauge connections, I have to introduce the universal cover. And Z tells me on which sheet of the universal cover I am. Because... Okay, so you, get, you have a second index and alpha theta on the first formula and, and alpha zero on the second, but the theta zero... Right, so uh, theta will appear in a second and this bold phase alpha is again yeah. the lift. So this basically says that uh, if you had, if you naively thought that your manifold had say three flat <coughs> connections, now what I'm telling you is that it has to have infinitely many copies, but ends should be such contributions of 
all of them, of, of all this tower, should be such that each individual and alpha and bold face alpha sum up into what we used to call n alpha. So n alpha is a contribution of this connection alpha, and bold face alpha means means it's integral lift. So that's that's first delicate point that you encounter again in gauge theory, trigonometric, hyperbolic integrable systems, things like that, Q difference equation. But, but your gauge group is here, SL to C. And you're descending down to SU2. Yes. Oh, here, here I was saying that, okay, sorry, th th that's, that's a good question indeed. So uh, here, th this last part of the equation says that originally this uh, witten rishi sihin turayev invariant is defined by SU2 gauge theory. So our contour is uh, such that all real uh, points should contribute with coefficient 1, at least that's what we... Well, that, that's, that's basically part of the choice of the constant C that Marcus was telling us in the first part of the talk. So it's part of its additional data. It basically tells you how, uh, how to set up your problem. And there, the problem is set up in such a way that you want the coefficients to be 1 if uh, alpha is SU2 flat connection and 0 if it's not. So that, that's the definition, if you wish. It's part of the definition of how we want to define Chern Simon's path integral. We want to define it by integrating over real slice in this complexified space of fields. So that, that's basically the second it equation. It is not really well defined from this point of view. Though. Exactly. And yeah, I'm, that's, that's what I believe I say on the next slide. Indeed, it's not well defined. And this Lefschetz symbols exhibit Picard Lefschetz monodromies. So if you start varying parameters, such as h bar or q or other parameters, you will have Stokes phenomena. And Stokes phenomena are basically saying that if you go from one configuration to the other, where I just draw for you projection on the Borel plane, what happens is that a given contour gamma receives contributions uh, from other contours, and uh, the intersection numbers <coughs> will determine for you how, what's, what's the coefficient. So that's another interesting phenomenon I want to emphasize. In a finite dimensional problem, the Stokes coefficients, or at least in picard lefschetz theory, these coefficients are integers because they're intersection numbers of some cycles, Lefschetz symbol and Lefschetz anti symbol. So what happens? Non zero cycles, I think. There may be zero cycles, uh, and you, can, you are integrating over the zero cycles, for the cycles, which gives you zero. <coughs> so you must. Uh, well, the in usual picard lefschetz theory, these uh, cycles are mid-dimensional in the space of complex fields. So their intersection number is, again, if you're in a nice situation, it's just a number. It's an integer because it counts the intersection points of two mid-dimensional cycles. So it's just an integer. Uh, but I want to emphasize that here, because of the first issue that we had infinitely many saddle points, what's going to happen is that effectively these numbers will become fractional. And that's a pretty cool phenomenon because we'll have sum of integers, sum of say plus minus ones, and uh, they will be, they'll need to be regularized, resummed, and as a result you get some interesting fractions. So this is another tricky point which usual picard lefschetz theory cannot handle, but resurgence does extremely well if it's, it's very clever. So that's, uh, I think, where I'm heading next, yeah. So you want to treat <coughs> this kind of problem using resurgent analysis, which projects everything to the Borel plane. You don't have to think about this infinitely many copies in the space of fields. It will do it for you by itself, even if you are very naive, and, but if you care about what happens in the space of all the variables, you can do that too, but it will take care of it. And very naively what you do is the following. You take your perturbative series, such as this h-bar expansion, you divide by r factorial, which are this <coughs> r-loop coefficients, exactly as Marcus explained in his talk, and produce uh, Borel um, sum uh, bz of xi. And <coughs> Then, just like in number theory, you ask about analytic structure of this function. You don't just do the summation, you ask, does this have analytic continuation to complex plane? And if so, what are the singularities? What are the residues? Very much like what we did for L functions. Now, <coughs> mm, let's see. So this picture is 
illustration of uh, Borel resummation, where you only sum not up to infinity, but just take first couple of terms. And uh, this is what you can easily do with Mathematica if you're like me and don't want to spend too much time on uh, either thinking about abstract argument or uh, even in Mathematica, you don't have to have high power. Marcus is extremely good at this. Uh, I know only how to do, say, five terms or three terms. It's quite amazing that this actually is uh, very nicely behaved and pretty fast convergent, at least in good examples. So this is done with very poor accuracy, but you already can start seeing that something is probably happening on the imaginary axis, that you may have some singularities. This is supposed to be profile plot for, for this Borel sum. Indeed, what happens, you have poles on the imaginary axis, and again, I want to emphasize with this slide that what you have to care about or keep in mind is what are the singularities on the Borel plane and what are the residues. That basically, at least for me, tells what resurgence is supposed to produce and uh, encodes the most essential data about the problem. So it's like a snapshot, like a photograph of a Borel plane. That, that, that says a lot. So in this case, again, coming back to our example, you perform lateral Borel summation, and because everything was on a, uh, all the singularities on an imaginary axis, you can deform contour and basically sum of the residues. But the only thing that's going to happen is you're summing over infinitely many saddles. So in Picard-Lefschetz theory, it's very hard to develop a homology theory or any sort of homological machinery which deals with this infinite number of intersections and so on. But in the Borel plane, that's very easy. We just have infinite sum of residues, and that's not a big deal. And it produces for you uh, some final answer in the form, again, that Marcus explained. And here I think this quote by Hadamard is very appropriate, especially in this occasion. And um, right. So the two key ingredients are the coefficients and alpha beta, which tell us how corrections to saddle point alpha will come from other saddle points. These are called trans-series coefficients. And then position of singularities on the Borel plane determines for you the exponentials. This is precisely what Marcus explained in his introductory talk. So since he already spent quite a bit of time on exponentials, I'll um, emphasize for you the structure of these trans-series coefficients and alpha beta. As I already mentioned, they come, at least in this kind of problem or in any other trigonometric or hyperbolic problem, from infinite sums. And you get sums of plus minus ones, which are basically the intersection numbers. The only thing you have to sum infinitely many times plus minus ones. You can do it using zeta function regularization. You get this kind of expression, which essentially then boils down to some fractions. Okay? And that's a very interesting phenomenon, which in this context leads to, to a miracle that I'm going to summarize for you in the form of a theorem. So this theorem comes from a paper of um, <coughs> myself, Marcus, and Pavel. And it says something interesting. So if you have, in the chern simons theory, you have different flat connections which have different stabilizers. So part of the gauge group may still fix your flat connection. And if that happens, the flat connection is called reducible. So it turns out, if you think about it from the viewpoint of picard lefschetz theory or resurgence theory, that reducible flat connections are such that they um, can receive contribution from non-abelian ones as trans-series, but not the, the other way around. So there is directionality. So irreducible and reducible are not the same at all. And again, part of this has to do with the fact that they have stabilizers. So that's an interesting theorem. And a consequence of this theorem is something cool. It says that you can decompose your witten rishi teching turai invariant into sum of blocks, call them basic classes, for instance, by analogy with Donaldson theory, how it decomposes into cyber witten invariants, basic blocks or basic classes labeled just by abelian flat connections. And it turns out that these guys do have nice analytic continuation inside the unit disk, even though original fellow doesn't. Again, I have no idea how to analytically continue 
with an Rishi teaching to arrive and variant from roots of unity. Abelian means reducible. Yes, in, right, sorry, I'm talking about SU2 groups, so for me, reducible abelian are the same, but in general, you're absolutely right. Reducible. So, with an Rishi teaching to arrive variant is only defined at roots of unity. And a big question in this field is how to give a Q series. <laughs> Again, I don't know the answer to this question, but what I do know is that to a given three manifold, you can associate not just one, but collection of Q series expansions labeled by abelian or reducible connections. Each one is well defined in the unit disk, and they do have exactly this property that if you approach roots of unity from inside the unit disk, you get uh, the corresponding value. All, all the complex stuff went away, right? These are all unitary yes. connections. These are unitary connections. Um, no, 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 this, this is complex. The, 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 this is complex uh, with the point that if, K, if, if Q approaches root of unity, they have to reproduce with an Rishi teaching to arrive, which is the real slice. No, I meant the connections are, what connections are? Unitary connections or complex in this discussion? In principle, uh, if, you're, if you're inside the unit disk, if Q is complex, any, any Q with less than one norm, then all contribute all, all flat connections, real and complex, contribute to this expression. So, all of that. So, but from the point of view of partition function, we are calculating partition function of chain simers on M3 of unitary, con unitary chain simers, or we are calculating complex function? Unitary, but then it decomposes into sum of all possible contributions. The partition function is a unitary connection, right. but it, right. it's rewritten in terms of something which is abelianized and complexified. Correct. And it's abelianized in a very funny way. So again, it's abelianized in a way where you take, um, so maybe a, that, that's another question I wanted to raise, where you have, um, I can't uh, think about Z, a, Z with the subscript AM3 as some kind of abelian partition function. It is not true. I can't think of it. You can, but I don't know how to do it in Trent Simons theory. In, in using some string theory language, you can. So I feel that, that this may be getting a little abstract. Let me see a show of hands. I'm going to finish in five minutes, don't worry. Uh, how many of you are happy with picard lapsus theory? Just to make sure that I'm not losing everybody. Okay. Just picard lapsus theory. Okay, how many of you are happy with picard lapsus theory with infinitely many picard lapsus monodromies happening at the same time? <laughs> okay, not so bad. So for the rest of you, uh, that's the luxury of the physics talk. Okay, I have a demonstration. So I just want to explain what's going on here. Okay, so we have a theory where we have infinitely many critical points, subtle points, and uh, let me represent each subtle point so by, by a bin. So this is going to be um, reducible flat connection. This is going to be irreducible flat connection. And that's another reducible guy. So to make it easier, I'll denote irreducible ones, non-abelian flat connections by red uh, crystal balls. So there are infinitely many copies of each flat connection, each subtle point, because of this lift to universal cover. So I represent them by infinitely many stones, red stones sitting here. So that's going to be reducible. So middle one will be irreducible. You have infinitely many copies because of this infinite cover issue or hyperbolic nature of the problem of a subtle point. And this is going to be another This is going to be another uh, non-abelian, sorry, abelian flat connection. So reds are abelian, white is non-abelian. So what happens in this process of Borel resummation or, or resurgence is that this guy gets distributed among the abelian ones. So the contribution is still there, just like it was in the witten rishi teaching to Riven variant. witten rishi teaching to Riven variant sums all of them with a coefficient one. But what happens here is that First of all, you have infinitely many copies. That's the first phenomenon. And second is that because of the picard lefschetz monodromies that are plus minus one summed infinitely many times, this guy 
non-abelian fellow gets distributed with coefficients, say, one-third and two-thirds. So what I should do to produce, to produce this object ZA on the right-hand side, I should redistribute. So these are now ZAs, and they do have everything we had before, where total now is divided just into reducible fellows. Okay? So hopefully this will clarify for you what picard lefschetz theory with infinitely many Lefschetz symbols means. So, and maybe as a question, and I think I should probably conclude here, uh, I want to ask for other phenomena, maybe in number theory, where the following happens. You have some entity which is total, and for us this was total written Rishi Tihin to Riven variant, and in my example it was contribution of uh, reducible, irreducible plus another reducible, and the middle guy gets redistributed into these two with some coefficients, say one-third, two-thirds, such that the total sum is still there. Uh, and I want to ask if you know of any other phenomena, for example, a number theory or elsewhere, where some objects of slightly different nature, there should be some analog of reducible, irreducible, maybe abelian, non-abelian, get redistributed <coughs> in very similar way. For, in, for example, I could find uh, L packets in the Langlands correspondence being somewhat analogous where, again, you have certain representations and you package them together. You group them in classes with certain coefficients, which are kind of analogous to this trans-series coefficients. But um, I would love to hear of more, more examples. So finally, I don't want to take more of your time. I want to point out that once you start with this perturbative series expansion in 1 over k in Chern Simon's theory, you do this clever Borel summation. Resurgence is very smart. It takes care of all these pole summations and so on. You produce this object ZA, and these guys now have, first of all, by definition, because we were summing over steepest descent contours, they're well defined inside the unit disk. So this is actually Q series. And second of all, they turn out to have integer coefficients. So some magic happens where for any three manifold in this Chern Simons <coughs> theory, not only you continue your Witten Rishi Tichin Turaivan variant away from the roots of unity inside the unit disk, for each of these basic blocks, ZA, they start having integer coefficients as fu functions of Q. So that's, to me, magic. I have no explanation of this. From a mathematical point of view, physics suggests why it should be the case, but um, that's, that's at least the result. So it turns out that these are precisely mock modular forms that we saw on the previous slide, at least in the context of ciphered manifolds. Probably not in general, but at least there. Okay, I think my time is up, so I should stop. Other questions? <coughs> ZA do not have integral coefficients. So ZA uh, are basically, yeah, so th there is a question of notation in our paper. There are ZAs and ZA hats, and they're simple linear con combinations of each other. So I promised you two theorems, and I managed in my time to get only to the first. Second theorem would tell you which linear combinations have integrality. But that's, that's I would say, a slightly simpler issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, regarding the categorification of Q series, the first question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, as far as I recall, there is a paper by Spectre. Uh, he actually used this uh, Witten index and uh, derived Jeta function as some uh, measure of uh, some physical system, something. So, I think uh, this kind of configuration exists in the physics literature. Then, I think Alan Cohns and Barnell, mm -hmm. Barnell, uh, number theorist. So. He also has similar things, but derived from the Spectre's uh, Spectre paper. I think Spectre wrote two papers. One is uh, halfly broken on a halfly broken supersymmetry, and it is one is. And what is the Q series that we're categorizing? Uh, I think he constructed something out of that. Means I don't recall. I see. So for something. Your information as as, as okay. you suggested. Uh, well. I would love to have the reference, and again, for some isolated things, of course, this is easy. Actually, yeah. 
I hope uh, my question is how general would that be? Because so here, for example, this is for class of mock modular forms. I would love to have it for some big classes, not just one single example. But anyway, I'll take so a look. It's for the zeta function. You, you it's I somehow related to some Riem uh, Hilbert polya construction. So uh -huh. okay, sounds good. Thank you. Very very useful. Yeah. So can you explain why the theorem one is true? Okay, so theorem one is true for the following reason. And again, that should be also a good lesson for resurgence because, so what happens is <coughs> you have subtle points, one, and, and irreducible guys are non-degenerate subtle points. Reducible ones are very degenerate because you have further action by stabilizer of the group. So it's, they're actually stacky. So what we're dealing with, we're dealing with picard lefschetz monodromies or crossing Types of singularities were. Huh? So you're saying it's not A1? It's not A1, no, not at all. Right, so from singularity theory point of view, and in Trent Simons, this is unavoidable because f a trivial flat connection A equals zero is always a flat connection, and it's highly reducible. It's all of the group G stabilizes that guy. So in Trent Simons theory, you cannot have a situation where all your critical points are nice, Morse, or even Morse bot. You're in a situation where there is this big degeneracy. And what's happening is basically the denominator, the quotient by additional <coughs> stabilizer, shifts the Morse index in such a way that Lefschetz thimbles, if you think about it from picard lefschetz monodromy point of view, don't even see each other. So they, they are in a different uh, grading or different dimension. So from Morse theory point of view, they're uh, in the wrong position, not mid-dimensional anymore. So that's the difference between reducible and reducible. So as a smoking gun for resurgence or quantum field theory or anything else that you may be interested in, if your singularities are not just poles or not just simple uh, singularities in picard lefschetz theory, there is some degeneracy, you should expect phenomena like this, where there will be directionality. So in this case, again, reducible can pick up irreducible as pieces, but not the other way around. So it's, it's all about singularity. This statement is independent of M3, right? Whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's independent of M3, and in fact, it's uh, independent of this infinitely many copies. It's uh, just about behavior of picard lefschetz <coughs> thimbles for degenerate subtle points. So, and, and, and Fortunately or unfortunately, they're completely unavoidable in Trent Simons theory, so we had to deal with that. You have more question? <coughs> so at the beginning of the talk, you ask question one about some cohomological origin of Eisenstein series. But you know there is, there is some Eisenstein symbols that gives you Eisenstein series of the form that you wrote. So it's a lattice sum. Typically it comes with a character in the numerator, and it associated with cycles. So for example, you can get a, a version of the E4 series with some character from three cycles on Krugo varieties. It's, it's called it's, it's Bellinson construction. And from that, you, I mean, you can lift up by computing some HK interval, something that is induced by the, I mean, the, the homology or the cohomology of the, of the the, the I see. So th th there is some HMN, some doubly graded homology groups that, that give you Eisenstein series? Yeah, so there's a, there, there is something that is attached to, to the cycles uh -huh. that is called the Eisenstein symbols that leads to some Eisenstein series, holomorphic one, with characters. And, uh, and they are just, I mean, you see, they're produced by some, some time ago. Well, excellent. I would, I would love to learn more about it. Yeah.